Middle Way Philosophy, Introductory Video 6D, Individual and Political Integration, Microcosm and Macrocosm, by Robert M. Ellis. This is a tributary video to video number six on integration. That video used the two mules pictures to illustrate integration in general. The two mules are in conflict with each other, but they can also represent conflicts within ourselves. It's when they reach a point of frustration that the two mules are forced to reframe the beliefs that led them to conflict with each other and thus to create a more harmonious and helpful way of understanding their situation. The basic pattern of integration as shown by the two mules pictures is the same pattern at both individual and socio-political levels. At the individual level, you could see the two mules as showing a psychological conflict between different desires that we may have at different points or different desires which are held unconsciously as opposed to consciously. At socio-political level, the conflicts that we're dealing with could be between different groups in society or they could be between different nations or other political entities. The point of the parallel is that there's a similarity in pattern between the conflicts which occur and the integrations which can also occur at each level. But how should we understand this similarity between the two different levels? It's a parallel that's been made going back to ancient times. Plato made it. It's often referred to as the parallel between the microcosm and the macrocosm. Different worlds, if you like, the small world and the big world. Plato was concerned to explain that set of concepts uh, in rational terms. So in the Republic, he wanted to explain the nature of an ideal Republic so that he could also show the nature of an ideal individual soul. However, we don't have to take on board all of Plato's assumptions in order to make use of the basic idea of the parallel between the microcosm and the macrocosm. There is a pair of basic fallacies that we should take care to avoid in making a kind of macrocosm, macrocosm comparison. These are known as the fallacies of composition and division. The fallacies of composition and division assume that the same properties should apply to individuals as to groups in exactly the same way, but it's not necessarily the case. For example, supposing you had a group, say an army, that was well organised. That would not necessarily mean that every individual within that army was well organised. Or, to put it the other way round, if a particular individual was well organised, that wouldn't necessarily mean that the army as a whole was well organised. Even if every single individual in the army was well organised, that wouldn't necessarily mean that the army as a whole was well organised. That would depend on social and political properties, which were about the relationship between all those individuals, not just about what each of the individuals was like, taken in isolation. So the relationship between individual integration and group or political integration is not a necessary one in that sense. Nevertheless, there's a similarity in structure and each of them also provides a condition for the other. So individual integration contributes to group integration by making it more likely, if all the individuals are integrated, that the group as a whole can become integrated. But it also works the other way around. So group integration creates better conditions for individual integration. It's more likely that an individual will be able to go through that process of reframing and reconsidering their assumptions, the ones that create conflict within themselves, if the environment around them is conducive to doing that. Let's illustrate that with the example of the school. The school is composed of students. On the one hand, more integrated students make a better school environment. That's because the students are more likely to see the value of the education they're being offered and they're less likely to disrupt 
the environment of the education. On the other hand, though, also a more integrated school creates better education for the students. So a more integrated school, for example, might mean one where the management or the government that runs the school is in harmony with the values of the teachers that actually deliver the education. That means that there's uh, more likely to be a consistent approach which takes into account the different needs of the students and that means the students are more likely to successfully learn in that context. Wherever there's a social or political conflict though, it's worth bearing in mind that that conflict only exists because it's instantiated in the actual bodies and psyches of the people who are involved in that group or that political organisation. The way in which the conflict perpetuates itself is due to positive feedback loops on each side of the conflict. So a theory or a belief gives rise to particular ways of acting to practices which tend to create new conditions which are simply confirm the beliefs involved. There's just there's a loop within which say a particular group on one side of the argument or a particular set of feelings in an individual tend to perpetuate the conflict against an alternative set of beliefs that have a different feedback loop. Think about that in relation to say World War II. There's a, a large scale conflict. So we have whole areas of the world consisting of sets of countries put together, each of which has its own positive feedback loop. Let's take the example of Nazi Germany, say. The theory of Nazism gives rise to the practice of Nazism, which tends to reinforce the belief in Nazism. So you get a socially and politically fueled positive feedback loop. But that positive feedback loop only exists within the minds of each of the individuals concerned. So you could also put that positive feedback loop in the mind of a particular soldier. Their beliefs are also reinforced by the practice that they keep encountering. Their commitment to the fight is only created by this positive feedback loop. It will be in conflict with an alternative positive feedback loop, which may be repressed, which will make them aware of alternatives, of other possible ways of understanding the situation and what they should do in it. The total relationship between individuals, desires, groups, and bigger societies or political units is very complex. That's often because different individuals belong to a variety of groups which may overlap and relate in complex ways to each other. Groups also stack up in hierarchies, so smaller groups may be parts in turn of bigger groups. So for example, the Hitler Youth was part of the whole Nazi group as a whole. This diagram may help to show something of that complexity and also how repression can take place within the socio-political uh, way of thinking. So if you think of a nation or society as a whole, which you may identify with a particular belief, let's say Nazism for Nazi Germany, that's represented here by a particular colour, say purple. So if the whole nation or society has the purple belief, what does that actually mean? Well, it probably means that there's a big group in that society which at least formally holds that belief. But there'll also be another group which doesn't. But that group is repressed by the other group. If you then work downwards, you'll find other beliefs. So the big group that may be identified with a belief such as Nazism will actually have a small group that more sincerely believes in that and another group within that which is repressed but perhaps left to itself would maintain another group, another belief such as socialism say. Within that smaller belief, the red belief as we have it marked on here, there'll be a number of individuals. Some of those individuals may 
sincerely hold to the belief of the group, but others may have another belief. They may have been outvoted by their group or out pressured in some other way. Within each of those individuals, though, there are also a variety of possible desires. Some of those desires will match up to the official ideology. Others will be quite different. But in the end, there'll be a complex pattern of repression, whereby perhaps individuals will repress their alternative desires in order to fit in with their immediate group, or perhaps they would press them to fit in with the wider group further up. Political integration at the top then is often a rough and ready process. You wouldn't expect it at all to resolve the vast majority of the conflicts that exist further down in the hierarchy. What it just means is that those in power uh, enter a degree of belief which is sufficient to stop conflict occurring. So a basic mediation or a peace agreement between two warring parties will do that. And in order to create that kind of peace, there needs to be the kind of dialectical process gone through, like that of the two mules. They need to stop fighting, they need to pause, they need to reconsider the situation, they need to reframe their beliefs, so as to need at least make the kind of compromises that are necessary in order to stop immediate violence and conflict. Longer term political integration can be greatly facilitated by democracy. At least in democracy, the differing parties have at least put aside violence and are required to have a dialogue with each other, a dialogue in which it's possible that some people may change their minds. At least the conditions are created for new kinds of beliefs to appear, which address the conditions better than those that were held before for the basis of conflicts and disagreement to be addressed and for conditions to be addressed better. So although democracy is not itself the same as integration, it can be an important condition that contributes to it. Even for individuals who are forced to critically examine different beliefs, it may create integration between those different beliefs. However, in the political context, Conflict is not always resolved. There are still people who refuse to cooperate with each other, resulting in injustice, violence or criminality. That's where power has to be used. One of the key theses of middle way philosophy is that the use of power in this way can only be justified by a greater degree of integration on the part of those who use the power compared to those who have power used against them. For example, the integration of the government as opposed to the integration of a criminal. That's a point which will be explored in more detail in subsequent videos about the politics of the middle way. So to summarize, individual integration has a similarity of structure with socio-political integration though neither necessarily implies the other. The macrocosm microcosm relationship involved is one of interdependent conditions between the higher level and the lower level, not fallacies of composition or division, assuming a necessary relationship between the two. Every socio-political conflict is basically one of differing desires and beliefs in individuals. Groups have complex hierarchies and interrelationships, but each of them has formal or informal bases of judgment within the group that may be repressive or on the other hand, may be relatively integrated. Negotiation, mediation and democracy are common means of integrating groups and overcoming conflict at political level. But where that doesn't work, the exertion of power of groups over individuals can only be justified by their relative integration. <laughs>